So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, webinar uh, on the topic of um, virtual teams and leadership. Uh, the webinar is organized by the uh, Swiss Chamber of Commerce, Switzerland Global Enterprise, the Swiss Trade and the Stockholm School of Economics, House of Innovation. Uh, before we start the actual session, um, a few points of order. Uh, we're going to keep um, the presentations at the beginning without possible uh, possibility of, of Q&A between ses uh, sessions or presentations, and we save all the, the, the Q&As for, for afterwards, but we have ample time reserved. Uh, the, the aim is to, to, have, uh, to, to give you some impulses and um, give you food for thought. Uh, we hope that you will participate actively during the Q&A session. If you have questions during the presentations, you can put them in the chat. Uh, and, and please keep the questions rather short, not A, B, C, D questions directed to everybody, but rather refer a question to, to one or two of the, of, of the speakers. Uh, after the presentations, we will op open up for verbal questions. So we will first deal with the with the questions in the chat, and then we will uh, continue uh, orally, so to speak. And um, uh, I think that we will have also time to to um, to create a general discussion. So. Uh, if you have questions uh, during the Q&A session, just use the raise the hand function uh, and we will, uh, we will get to you um, as soon as we have dealt with the, the previous questions. We will also be um, doing some polls during the presentations just to keep you on, the, on your toes. Um, we can just do a quick uh, initial poll now. to see if you uh, are already uh, tuned in. So it seems that, that there is some, uh, some in experience and most have actually uh, had mainly ad hoc uh, based uh, work in teams, uh, virtual teams, but also uh, some have have um, a, a good system in place. Um, so. Uh, we all of this will be recorded and you will also get the results of the polls afterwards if there are technical issues andrea nielsen from the house of innovation will uh, will help you raise your or put your your issue in the chat now um i think we will uh, kick off um, already a bit ahead of schedule with um, Frida Pemer from the Stockholm School of Economics. Frida, the floor is yours. Sorry, I, I was muted. Apologies for that. <laughs> Rookie mistake. Uh, right, so very, very happy to be here to meet all of you in this webinar. So I'm an associate professor at the Stockholm School of Economics, and I'm just going to share a few ideas from research on how to deal with and understand what we're going through right now with the COVID-19 crisis and pandemic. So if we just uh, take the next slide, please. Thank you. Right, so Andrea and I, we are situated at the Stockholm School of Economics. Perhaps you're familiar with it. It's uh, located in Stockholm in Sweden. And it's um, ranked as one of the best, or not, well, the best uh, economic school in the Nordic countries, which is something that we're very happy about and working hard to sustain, of course. And we can move to the next slide. Thank you. Yes, so 
Andrea and I, we are representing the house innovation at the Stockholm School of Economics. And what is that? Well, it's not just an academic department, but it's also a hub for research, gathering leading experts across the globe in areas related to digitalization, to innovation, to entrepreneurship, etc. So in this house innovation, we have a lot of things going on. For instance, we have research groups that are funded by our corporate partners. For example, we have the Scania Center for Innovation of Innovation Excellence. And we have the Jacob and Marcus Wallenberg Center for Innovative and Sustainable Business Development. But we also have a more entrepreneurial part of it. We have the SSC Business Lab, which is the Stockholm School Economics Incubator. And we have SSES, which is a consortium of the five main universities in Sweden. In Stockholm. So it's a, it's a very nice place to be and there's a lot of interesting things going on there. Right, so having said that, I would like to start off with the very first poll. And um, I'm going to ask you what you think about working from home. Because we're all working from home, we have been doing it and it can be challenging. So what do you think is the greatest challenge of working from home? Is it uh, drawing a line between the professional private lives, or is it not to meet in person, but communicating via digital tools? Lack of informal conversations? Finding time to plan for the next normal phase while dealing with the current crisis? Or perhaps you're one of those people who think it's great to work from home. No challenges at all. So please submit your answers. I will see what you, where you are. And it usually takes a little minute before all the answers are gathered. And Andrea, you're going to show the answers once we have them. Perfect, thank you. Right, so we can see here that a clear majority thinks that it's uh, the lack of informal conversations and spontaneous meetings with my colleagues. And I'm not surprised about this, especially given where you are in your organizations. Um, this is a central challenge. We're going to talk about it in just a minute. But we also have 20% saying that it's not the challenge, it's great. And I'm really happy to see that because there are strategies for how to work from your home office and still enjoying it and making it work really well. Great. So thank you so much for participating in the poll. And let me just show, some, um, show a slide with some insights from the research. Yes, thank you. So I think, a good way of thinking about this crisis is to see it as a work-life disruption. Normally we talk about market disruption, like Clayton Christensen and the digital disruption that we are facing, technology-driven disruption and so on. But this pandemic has really created a work-life disruption because the way we perform work has changed totally and also globally across the globe. And we can find inspiration from three lines of research here, which this slide illustrates. So starting with the research on digitalization, well, we can see here that the pace of digitalization has really picked up. We used to, to be able to plan for digital transformation or to at least have some projects going on, thinking perhaps we should do this next year or the year after that. But now we cannot do that anymore because digitalization is happening everywhere at the same time. So it's like a crash course in many organizations. We cannot choose not to use digital tools because we need them to perform our daily work now. So that's really changing and it's causing a lot of stress in some organizations because you feel the need to keep up with this growing pace. And what you can see here is that in this disruption, it's the normal work activities that are affected. It's not just working with customers or working with suppliers and using digital tools, AI automation, or working with internal operations. It's all the everyday activities, administrative activities, HR, legal, finance, whatever. They're all affected by this. And it has changed, of course, the communication as we saw in the last poll as well. We are communication, communicating via virtual tools. And all in all, we can say that this is increasing the technology readiness in most organizations. So, after the crisis, I guess a very safe guess is to say that most organizations are going to be ready to use more digital tools, to work more with AI, to work more with automation. 
And that is going to change the competitive landscapes in most industries. So we have to be prepared for that. A second thing that could be interesting to discuss in this uh, webinar has to do with boundary management. There's a line of research about this, and it's a focusing on how you divide between your professional life and your private life. And what we see now is that these boundaries are becoming blurred. So normally when we go to work, we have a transition period. We go by car or we walk or we commute or we take the bicycle or whatever, but we have time to prepare. We're going from home to work or we're going from work to home. And this helps us to mentally uh, prepare ourselves for what's to come. And we can also see that before the crisis, we could use two different strategies for how to deal with the professional and private boundaries. And the classic one is to use segmentation. And this means that you have very clear boundaries. So when you go to work, you put on specific work clothes, you talk about business with your colleagues, and you don't talk about personal matters, you don't have photos in the workplace, etc. But we can also see that integration has become more and more common, especially in tech companies, in startups, and in incubators, where the idea is to integrate the entire human being into the workplace. So also your creativity, your ideas, your emotions, everything should be part of your work. So here you can see that they organize for you know, bringing families to office parties, if you have gym, you can do yoga at the workplace, you have kindergartens, you can bring your pets, whatever. So it's really integrating the two worlds. Now what's happening today, which I would like to highlight here, is that we have two things that we need to deal with as managers. On the one hand, we have the involuntary integration, which means that when we're working from home, we find ourselves being exposed or exposing ourselves to our colleagues. Because all of a sudden, we show our colleagues what it looks like in our homes. Perhaps you have family members coming into the room, or you have a cat jumping up in your knee. Or all of a sudden, you have a video meeting with a colleague who is sitting in his or her bedroom. That's quite private. But that's, that's what we see. And for a lot of people, this feels a bit stressful. Because you want to keep your professional self visible to your colleagues, but not your private personal self. For instance, I have, I've had video meetings with senior managers who had been using their bathroom as their home office because that was the only quiet place that they could find in their home. And that's also, you know, breaking the boundaries between what's really private and what's the professional side. So that's a risk. And also it's difficult for people to say, this is my work hours, because you can always work. Work is always there in your home. And home is also always in your work. So that's a problem that we need to deal with. The other thing here is the unintended segmentation. And this is rather serious because normally at work, we, we meet with people accidentally. I mean, we meet with someone at the coffee machine or in the elevator or by the reception. We have a chat and we have a conversation and joking and so on. But this is not happening that much when we're working from the home office because now we have planned meetings, we have planned conference calls, the, we invite people to the meetings and so on. So there are no random meetings. And a lot of these social activities are eroded when we work from home. And that's really important because the social parts, the informal parts, are really the grease that keeps the machinery going in organizations or the glue that sticks the employees together. And a lot of people now are feeling isolated. There's a lot of stress among people working from their home offices. And a fear of missing out, really. It's not that teenagers, but also employees across the globe, feeling that perhaps everyone else is in a meeting, but I'm not. Am I not being seen? Am I not important to my organization? And so on. So the unintended segmentation is a really powerful and riskful effect of the pandemic. So what can we do? Well, looking at the literature and transformative leadership, we can find some clues. And this is what I would like to share with you, that the first one is to work with the vision of the company. Of course, you already have a long-term vision for your firm, but to also develop a short-term vision for how to manage the crisis and to be able to communicate this repeatedly to employees who are working in their home offices, because that will help them to, to create a feeling of purpose, a feeling of belongingness. So even though I'm working away from my kitchen alone, 
I feel that I'm part of a bigger purpose here. I'm contributing to my organization. So it's part of the culture building aspect of leadership. I've done the informal leadership aspects, which I think we're going to talk more about in this webinar, are super important. And this is something we can see now that a lot of managers feel that I don't have any, I can't take the temperature of the organization. I, I can't see how my people, how my employees are doing. I can't pick up all these you know, cues from the organization. I can't test my ideas in informal conversations. So working with these things are super important right now. Try to find ways of performing these informal aspects of leadership. It could be just giving someone a call randomly to say, hi, how are you doing? Just wanted to check in with you. And to really stimulate this coffee breaks, whatever, to create this feeling of, of unity in the organization. And that also uh, points into the very last point here, the empathy, being empathetic, because a lot of people are feeling stressed right now, are anxious, are perhaps being ill or have family members that are being ill. And as a leader, we have to be well, empathetic and show that we care and that we take care of our employees. And these aspects are really the core parts of transformative leadership in normal digital transformation journeys, but they are sort of more important now in this pandemic that we're finding ourselves in. So just some, some ideas to sort of kick off the, the discussion here in the webinar. And I think I'm going to close it for now. So thank you. Thanks, Frida. Um, did you have a second, second poll that you wanted to do? I think I'm going to save that for later on. If okay, yeah. good. Uh, so then over to you, Thomas. Thank you very much, Gustav. Thank you, everyone. Uh, also, Frida, for uh, opening the door there uh, with, um, you basically said everything. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to shed light, uh, shed a bit of, of experience and practical aspects into, into what you were referring so nicely about this, um, about this uh, technology readiness, as well as the um, yeah, segmentation of, of, of personalities, of personal life. I think that's something we all experienced also here at SGE or Switzerland Global Enterprise um, very nicely. So thank you also for having me, Gustav, and, and the whole team uh, to give you some insights. Uh, next slide, please. The um, maybe just a quick few words on, on, on our organization. We are the Export and Investment Promotion Agency of Switzerland. We are a um, non profit organization, uh, belong to the uh, economic uh, department uh, here at, of Switzerland. And um, we, we've been doing this um, since around about 90 years, so fairly, fairly long term in this, in this subject. And we are supporting small and medium sized companies on the way out. And we're also looking for investors to set up their operations um, here in Switzerland, ideally. And um, the DNA of the organization is, is set up in a way that we have 100 employees within three locations here in Switzerland. Main or head office is in Zurich with um, around about 80 people. And then we have um, a, a smaller team in the Western part of Switzerland for the French speaking part, and then uh, a small team in the Italian speaking part in Lugano. And at the same time, we have uh, around about 100 employees globally. Um, so um, they are um, based in, in different locations, similar to Gustav, who is um, within the um, uh, embassy of uh, Switzerland in Stockholm. We have this uh, kind of uh, setup all around the world at 27 locations. And that is also where I'll be uh, talking about a little bit about the experiences because also the DNA and the, the way we work uh, here at headquarters uh, with, a, with a fairly um, <clears throat> homogeneous um, technology setup uh, compared and also uh, related to the setup we have uh, with the foreign with the minister with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for these hundred, uh, other hundred locations is is different, and therefore also the culture is different, and that has uh, been made very uh, clear or, or clearer 
uh, within this within this past weeks of of how we manage and how we work um, uh, globally and 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 virtually. Um, the the whole setup is decentralized. Uh, we we have uh, leaderships uh, for regions and and for antennas, so that's a, a layer of complexity in addition. And uh, we have been strongly investing in the past years in digital products and service offerings uh, for our clients. Um, so um, similar to any uh, exchange or, or information sharing, uh, we've, we've been fairly digital already. Um, so that didn't caught us on the wrong foot uh, when the crisis got in. We, we have the, the backbone sort of uh, already in place and there was a culture of working um, uh, electronically or virtually, uh, specifically also because we are communicating on a daily basis with our uh, people in the in the global network uh, around the world so that that was already in place but but still there was obviously some some challenges um, we have a fairly modern workforce and workplace design here in Switzerland. Uh, as I said, we, we used to work uh, uh, remotely. We have uh, cross-functional team management so along different units and, and uh, organizational structures. So, so that is fairly, um, fairly flexible and, and hybrid in, in terms of, of how we work on a, on a daily basis. Next slides, please. What um, we have seen and, and what of what the experience and I've, I've tried to throw uh, into these bullet points a few uh, inputs I have been hearing over the past weeks, not only from our organization and our global network, but also from our clients we are in daily contact and which are also being a small and medium sized company having different DNAs, uh, maybe fairly family-owned companies, traditionally way of working to, to, to the other side of the spectrum where we also support uh, young companies, um, startups or starters um, who are used maybe more of, of because of their DNA of working uh, remotely and, and not being um, that bound to an office. And I try to put this all into a mixer and blend it and, and, and present a few of the insights we have been given. So I think in the end that, that gives us a good um, basis for further discussion. And I'll be looking forward to what my other um, uh, speakers afterwards will, will, will also talk about their experience. Um, we've seen that the digital mindset need, needs to be promoted and trained. Um, we have to have a communication concept in place and also strategy. Not only here's the tool, use it, but what tool do we use for what situation and in what collaboration um, context, uh, meaning we, we have, we're using mainly Microsoft products, we're using Yammer, we're using Microsoft Teams, um, yes, we're using Zoom, uh, but uh, we're also using um, different um, sharing platforms and also collaborative work through the cross-functional teams where we would have team members in different areas of the world where they would uh, participate in workshops or, or sprints um, for, for clients. So how could we and how do we use the different tools and create sort of a, a guideline or a, or a, or a, ex, um, a suggestion of what tool will be used in what situation. And, and that at the same time <clears throat> could only be really implemented and lived uh, with, with the right dynamism and leadership. May it be from the direct superior, but also from the cultural context that um, people would, um, similar to a physical meeting, prepare, know how to use the tool, know how to behave when using the tool, and also give inputs if the tools were not um, helping them to achieve their goals in a, in a day to day activity and maybe some of the other um, participants would find out about the new tool and the other new um, software which would maybe uh, solve the problem quicker 
but what was not um, approved yet or not being used or not being trained. So how do we deal with um, the, the, the specific need of someone or within some teams where they say, actually, what US headquarter given us doesn't um, solve our problems in, in working virtually. Um, there's this tool, that tool, which, which makes much, much, um, much easier. Why don't we try this and test this? So with the time frames we would have and also the, the, the speed we would need to put on the on the on the on the speed uh, on the on, on the cooperation that was something um, we, we had to adapt quickly and also that's uh, sort of stressed out also our IT department but also our culture uh, meaning what tool as I said before it will be used for what um, at the same time, from, from conversations internally, and um, we, we had a, a few weeks ago a workshop uh, globally where we were gathering some inputs on, okay, what did you uh, experience over the past weeks? What were your learnings? And every time we, we did this, ex we did this um, the exercise, the main, uh, one of the main words which came up was trust. Trust in, in sort of um, how we work together. You don't have to be physically present in a in a room to uh, be able to deliver the right um, inputs and that re uh, trust would equate to leading through results rather than being present um, or, or, or visible uh, and keeping that and celebrating this this trust culture and and that success and 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 staying spontaneous with being uh, on, a, on a virtual context was something we have heard many times and, and experienced that over the over these uh, past weeks. Um, we also saw that um, the reach over hierarchies um, was, was much easier, um, more of a flattened leadership because everyone could reach quickly through it through a chat or a direct message or a WhatsApp group or whatever um, was in place, um, anyone in the organization. Yes, we could, answer, we could ask ourselves, why didn't we do this earlier? And this can happen also um, on, on, a, if on a regular day. But I think this was sort of forced stronger um, with this situation that, that people would, would quicker reach out to, to different people or through different hierarchies. Um, the boundaries were less high rather than um, they would have been or they were in the past. Um, one of the challenges was, as we heard already, this interpersonal uh, exchange. Um, we also experienced that um, problems, issues were escalating quicker and took longer time for de-escalation. I could not go over to a colleague where I heard there would have been a problem and have a quick coffee. Um, this informality, as, as also Frida mentioned, um, that's lacking. It had to be planned. It has to be planned. Um, so that, that needs to, we need to be aware of this and we needed to be aware of this uh, and, and, and also train our, our leaders and department heads to, to be still sensible through the camera of uh, through such situations uh, and 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 to be prepared for that, um, we definitely and we heard this earlier. We definitely missed the rituals, the water tank meetings, the daily stand up meetings. We started kicking up the team experience. Um, we we try to keep this relevant um, in a virtual place. So um, our colleagues here at the at the office created a, a virtual cafe where you could meet um, spontaneously like you would do in the cafeteria. Um, it was used. Um, it wasn't used that actively as we thought of, um, and maybe it's because of the format. So that was one also of the learnings I've heard from, from the exchanges that um, <clears throat> don't force upon a format or, or don't implement the format only to have a format of saying, okay, here's the, here's the virtual cafeteria, go use it. Um, allow the spontaneity and uh, maybe have a different format over a certain time and keep changing those formats to have this this, um, this activity um, ongoing and also have uh, a sort of a, a very um, surprising element to it in a positive way. Um, 
we also experienced uh, this asynchrony of communication because of the time zones. Um, people would come into a meeting maybe at five o'clock in the morning or in, in 11 o'clock in the night. So that's um, something we're used to because of the global network we have, but still having to perform in those different time zones in those different moments um, was sort of um, stronger challenged or, or challenging in than, um, than it, it used to be or could have been planned because now we have bigger teams on the calls uh, from different time zones uh, rather than uh, smaller ones we had in the past. Um, I mentioned already the importance of the challenge, uh, the channel, sorry, for the context of the communication. So what is, what is the right channel for what format? Um, the one-on-one -on -one, uh, channel, be it on, on, a, on a specific technology platform or more of a collaboration um, and the, define the, the rules within those collaboration chat. What chat is used for what context of the work. Um, so not everything which need to be tracked in a formality way uh, moves into a WhatsApp group, which is maybe less um, formal rather than a than the team projects like like Slack or or any other technology um, option, would there there would there's out there. So that's that's something we we experienced and had also to define quickly and and make up our minds what do we use in what context. And then um, I think as in a general context, um, also from our experience, what comes afterwards and how did that change the way we work? Um, we've all believed that this possibility to strengthen remote work and I'm explicitly not saying home office because I think home office is yes you sit in your home and work but the other thing is the remote work is work wherever you feel comfortable be it in a cafe be it on a on a on a on a train station be it uh, near a lake shore be it in your home or be it in the office that remote work um, is something which has gotten much more importance and also starts also defining um, the, uh, the, the attractiveness of, of being um, uh, an employer to, towards people um, who, who are applying to this and saying, am I able to, to do this remote work with you? Um, Switzerland is a small country, so um, people uh, can commute from one city to the other by train on a daily business, but it, it costs them quality of life, it costs them um, also also lost time. So that aspect has, again, been very accentuated within this crisis. And we believe here at SGE that this certainly is something we want to keep and we want to explore and further strengthen um, within within the the workforce we're we're employing here and and the options we are we're giving them so that is a bit of of the experience of what we what we have seen over the past weeks um, again a nice mix of different insights and and cultures and way to collaborate but um, we're very excited and, and see there's also a possibility and, 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 and an optimism um, which, which has been created by this uh, dynamic uh, developments over the past weeks, uh, the digital push, um, which, which certainly is, is a good um, a positive thing for all of us here. Thank you. Gustav? Yes, so what you're actually saying is that, that Switzerland is, is first losing all hierarchies and uh, Swiss are uh, starting to work from home. You're becoming Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I, I'll give the, the, the next word to, to uh -huh. Se Sebastian. Are you, you still with us? Yes. Thank you, Gustav. Um, I would like to tell you a little bit about the story here at SICA. First of all, good morning, everyone. And uh, I hope Hello. everybody um, uh, is safe and, uh, and healthy. Good morning, Sebastian. Hello. Good morning. Do you hear me? Yes. OK. OK, so before to start, I just would like to share with you two things. One thing about SICA. And, uh, and one thing about my personal view uh, of the situation. About SICA, just to give you a little bit of a background. So we are a 100 years old company. Uh, we are 24,000 employees and we operate in, uh, I would say, all major countries, more than 100. And uh, 
we operate in the construction industry. So we are providing solution products for construction, building and, and manufacturing industry. Uh, we have eight different businesses and we are very diverse and that can help us also during this crisis because we are in a mining business, in automotive, automotive business, in the retail, in contracting, in, uh, I mean, very diverse. And, uh, and right now, me as a general manager of SICA Sweden, I have three priorities. Number one is taking care of our people. Number two is taking care of our customers. And of course, number three is uh, business continuity. Um, but today, um, I would like to tell you something. At the first time for me as a leader, uh, maybe like many of you, um, this is the first time I'm facing a crisis at magnitude. I mean by that, uh, it's a historic scale and, and very complex. And at the beginning, I did not like it. Um, I did not like it because I like to control things and there is a lot of things you can control right now. Uh, it's new, uh, it's marathon, it's long, um, but in the meantime I decided to accept and to react. And um, based on what? Based on the values, myself, the company, the purpose of the company. And the good thing is um, there is a lot of things you can control in this crisis. Uh, you can control who you are as a person every day, and uh, you can also control who you act as a, as a company. And I think that's guiding us every day. Um, talking about switching to virtual teams, uh, pretty early in SICA Sweden, we have been guided by, the, by Switzerland, by the corporates, to move to home office. I think it was late February, early March, just after the February vacation. And uh, I can tell you something, from a technical standpoint, we were ready. Uh, everybody is having an iPhone, a laptop, we have Office 365, we have Teams, we have Zoom, we have Skype, we have WebEx for the webinars. So of course we have production here, so we had to make some adjustments. But technically we were ready. What I realized pretty fast, it's having the tools is great, um, but having the culture to use it, and the structure to use it, it's not the same game. So what I did is, um, uh, as a general manager of SICA Sweden, the first things we had set up a response team, meeting twice a week, uh, focusing on communication, looking at the pattern of this crisis. And for me, uh, I found out this crisis is in three phases. Phase number one, all countries try to flatten the curve. Phase number three, it's when the disease will be controlled. It can be a vaccine or it can be a cure. And now we are in between flattening the curve and, and the disease control. And uh, this is, we have to cooperate, to collaborate, to operate with the virus around us and with this uncertainty around us. So that's something was not easy to deal with. And the chance we have in Sika is uh, when the crisis hit Sweden and Europe, we already had a lot from our colleagues in China in how they dealt with the situation. And we had a lot from our colleagues from Italy. And that helped us to uh, structure our communication, internal, external, and also to, to organize ourselves. So that's, I would say, the, the big things. Uh, something I did also, it was mentioned by, uh, by Frida. Um, every Friday, tomorrow morning, every Friday, I have a 30 minute team meeting with all the organization very transparent communication. I have four KPIs I'm showing to the organization every Friday, and they have clear transparency of the situation of our organization from Sweden perspective, regional perspective, and global perspective. Every Friday, I make announcements, good news, bad news, but there is no surprise. And since day one, we decided to have a very transparent communication with all the organization. Uh, talking about um, boundaries, leaderships, also uh, losing uh, indirect communication. After the second month working from home, I implemented a very structured communication with my direct report and I'm motivating them to do the same with their people. Every week we have a one-on-one, -on -one, 30 minutes, camera on, so we can engage like am I looking now in my camera? And during the 30 minutes, uh, most of the time, me, 
as a as a manager, I stay quiet. I don't ask questions. I don't ask how are they doing, because I don't want to influence what are they going to tell me. So they know the rules. I, I explain them, and I want them to freely talk to me about whatever they want, related to business, related to personal, and uh, and this is my way of collecting feedback. So we have this one on one. And uh, the first thing I say when we start this communication is, what would you like to talk about today? And after, they tell me. It can be practical, it can be emotional, and that's how me, I collect feedback, information, stress level, and because of that, I can adjust communication, I can share positive things, I can, and I can also stop uh, emerging problems. So this is very important for me to have this uh, crisis team, one-on-one -on -one discussion, and also this, uh, this Friday breakfast. Um, on another note, uh, something, uh, when you look at uh, moving to virtual teams, there is a lot of challenges coming in, in terms of leadership. There is a lot of opportunities, and there is some learnings. In terms of uh, challenges, uh, my, my challenge is uh, usually when you run a crisis, you run it at, uh, at a sprint tempo, very fast. Uh, but this one, you cannot do it if not everybody will be exhausted, everybody will be stressed. So it's long, it's a high level of uncertainty. Uh, what I realized also is uh, home office uh, has some limits. Um, for me as a company, we have office space, uh, we have a structure to welcome people. And, um, and I think it's important to prepare also that. Uh, today, we respect uh, strictly the government recommendation, um, but I see some limitation in working from home. I see also, uh, as, as Frida mentioned, a lot of uh, communication disappearing, and that's not easy to reactivate this corridor, coffee machine, and lunch di uh, discussion. Um, also, the difficulty, the challenge is how do you keep a high level of engagement and how do you measure it? Uh, when you don't see people. Uh, so this is something. And something also I realized is uh, people has a tendency to say, ah, it's business as usual, but I, I disagree. Um, I think it's not business as usual. So it's really important to look at the steps uh, differently. Uh, from the opportunities, for me, the first thing I realized with this crisis, it's a fantastic test. It's a test for me. It's a test for the organization. It's a test for the manager and the people. It helped me to see how people react. Some people were good in the office. They don't manage from home. Some people were quiet in the office. They are very good from home, from leaders. So it's a very good situation for me to, uh, to observe. Uh, another thing is uh, there is value also and efficiency in remote work. So where is the balance? Uh, people are much more um i would say less disturbed uh, they do a lot of more things and of course from a cost perspective i can tell you uh, we are thinking again how we're going to look business traveling in the future uh, because today we run a company without traveling everybody's home so there is this impact and uh, that's that's um, raised some questions um Webinars, I think, like we are doing today, is uh, this is really a tool we are using right now. Uh, we realized uh, construction industry, we are not the first one, I would say, in digital transformation. But we realized we had some things in place, like eShop with uh, B2B customers and all these kind of things. And of course, there is something in place. People don't travel. There is a lot of social learning. There is a lot of online shopping. So we have to embrace those opportunities because they are already in place. And as an experience, um, I can tell you, I mean, I don't know what will be the new normal, but what I know it's going to be, the landscape will not be the same. And there is already some, some things in place. Um, so as an, ex, an experience for me, it's a very good learning. Uh, it's very good in terms of fast adaptation, fast decision, but also adjusting strategy, keeping the long-term strategy. Are we still fitting for the purpose? So the best I can do is, it was point A before the crisis. It's going to be point B after the crisis. How do I make point B better than point A? How do I build back better? 
And uh, one thing remains true in terms of uh, virtual teams is the teams are making the difference, not the tools. And uh, for me, it's important as a leader to really uh, embrace these opportunities. So it has been a really great experience for me, stressful, not easy, challenging, but I really feel fortunate working with my team. I feel fortunate being in Sweden. Uh, we were really fast adapting and, uh, and I'm really glad to, uh, to work for the company I'm working today. So I have a question, uh, a poll question. It's more about uh, how do we manage? I think we can bring the question. It's about uh, how do we deal with informal communication? Let's wait for the results. Something I can share with you is um, as I'm not meeting as often and as I would like with my uh, management team, Oh, thanks for the result. So here we can see how the coffee breaks over Zoom and uh, it's a majority and equivalent uh, virtual company meeting or uh, several of the, of the above. Uh, to give you an example, uh, next Friday I have my management team meeting and, uh, and I decided to go with uh, my management team in uh, Ulriksdal slot. So it's a nice place by the water uh, next to Stockholm area. And we're going to go for a walk with my management team because there is a lot of things happening uh, actually in Sika in Sweden. And uh, we're going to keep social distancing and uh, we're going to grab a sandwich. But that's we need to have this kind of communication uh, and to sometimes uh, it will be the first time we're going to meet again uh, since uh, we started to uh, work remotely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sebastian. Uh, you've uh, r certainly raised quite a few questions uh, with me, but I'll save them uh, till after. Our mm -hmm. next speaker, Jakob uh, Kiefer from uh, ABB, has um, presented his, his thoughts on the, on the issue. So, Jakob, uh, please, the screen is yours. Well, thank you, Gustav. And uh, first of all, can I just thank uh, the Chamber uh, for its work? As usual, excellent preparation. You, Gustav and Andreas, really thorough in your preparation, so, so great to have you. Uh, also fantastic to see Frida's, um, you know, work. I mean, you started very early on at Handelshag School and together with, you know, some big uh, donors to, to work on digitalization, all of a sudden you see what that investment has brought us. So thank you very much for that presentation. I, I'm, I would like to, to maybe hook up with you a little bit later to, to deepen our relationship with, with, your, uh, with your work. Uh, Thomas, you were so thorough, I don't know what to say after you have presented your work, uh, but I, I will give it a try. Uh, but you really have really mapped out, I think, all of the, uh, the issues I would like to talk to. And after God, I don't know what's left to say. Uh, but it's, it is quite interesting to see how, how we all react to this, because it is, uh, I mean, historically, uh, it, it, hopefully once in a lifetime uh, event for us. It, Cannot rule it out will happen again, but for me at least, this is the first time you really are forced to be isolated from the rest of the world, basically. And uh, as a company, I mean, we we were early on re reacting to this. You know, ABB is headquartered in, in Zurich, here in Switzerland, and it started quite early there with Italy. Uh, we had you know people uh, going skiing back and forth, so we closed quite early our operations and uh, started to work from home and. I think for ABB, being Swiss and Swedish, safety is always first. So I think everything followed from that. Um, and uh, um, we have had operations in China for many, many years. It's actually one of our biggest markets. Uh, we are almost like a Chinese company over there, sourcing 90% and producing for that market to 90%. And we could see what had happened. We were fortunate enough to not have any casualties, an extremely professional team. 
Uh, so, like God had said, uh, we we learned a lot from that situation. Uh, what happened over there? Uh, my role, uh, I I used to work as a diplomat for for many years in the Swedish Foreign Service, and uh, since September, I've joined then the um, uh, ABB as heading the the government relations and public affairs, and. Um, so, so one of my jobs is to actually keep track of what goes on in the world right now. What are the, what are the effects? So I would focus maybe a little bit more on that side. What, what have we done? And not talk so much about the organizational uh, things that have happened. So maybe a little bit outlooking uh, perspective. Uh, but maybe just to start off, I think, uh, I mean, we have been affected as a company. Uh, but not to the extent as other sectors. Uh, we have been quite resilient, but I think everybody have seen our uh, report and we, we're not alone to say that the second quarter, the third quarter will be you know, challenging for us. Uh, demand would probably slow a little bit and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tough situation, but so far, at least in Sweden, we have been able, uh, able to weather this out. Uh, and uh, I think we have a good you know, backlog also of orders and uh, the first quarter was surprisingly good, but. Uh, uh, let's wait and see now. I think we have just seen that the, the industrial sector has been maybe not taking the first hit, but maybe we'll take the second one. Uh, so, so that's uh, on the general uh, outlay. So my work, I work with a small team with a colleague, Ingrid, and our job is then to connect ABB uh, to, to the poly political sector. Uh, my job is to be, to be networking, to meet with people. Uh, to, to gather information and bring that to our management and to our business units. Uh, and I do that in Sweden, uh, but I'm also responsible for our relationship, ABB's global relationship with global institutions. And that was a work we were right in the, in the, in the midst of launching, basically, in, in February when this happened. And all of a sudden, you cannot travel anymore. It's just stopped. So I think that was a you know, wake up call. So, so what we do now, uh, if you don't have a relationship with an institution, say like the United Nations, one of their uh, agencies, uh, maybe you know somebody there, but you haven't really introduced yourself. Uh, I find that a little bit difficult. This, um, this work of diplomacy and work of networking, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a human thing. It's really human. And uh, even though we're sitting here, we're feeling quite comfortable. It is a bit. Uh, it's, it's not dull, I wouldn't say that. It's exciting, but it's almost, it, it takes away that human element. So uh, we, I think for me, the, the, the effects have been a little bit like this. The relationship you already have built up worked perfectly. You can continue, you can chat, you can do that. But if you want to create something new, if you want to build something new, I think the digital world is difficult. Uh, you need to have that first impression, you know, what does that person look like? Maybe have a meal and then you start from there. Uh, and I think that's, that's what we lack a lot, this human interaction with colleagues and, and your friends uh, in, and in general. And uh, uh, we'll see. I think there will be a lot of, uh, of uh, efficiency. We will do less travel. But I also think that as we move forward, uh, you need to connect with the old clients, and meet the new clients. Uh, so I think that um, there will be a transition and we will save a lot of money, but I still think if you want to develop your business, if you want to, to expand uh, your network, there, there's, no, uh, there's no other way because we are human after all. Uh, and uh, I think we can try it like you, like you do, uh, uh, Sebastian and, and the others to, to, to create, you know, type of spontaneous things, but it, it is quite difficult to create something spontaneous. Let's let's go for after work and meet. Yeah, we meet, but it, it's not the same. We know this. Uh, so so I think we're all longing to get back uh, to the office, but we're, we're still very cautious of doing that. We only have 30% uh, maximum capacity. You know, we cannot have more people in our, uh, in our head office, for example, and that will probably continue throughout the summer, even though uh, society is opening up. Uh, but let me now return a little bit to, to, uh, to what this has done to our activities. We are, we are doing two things now at ABB. We are divesting a, a, a significant part of our operation, the power grid operation, is being uh, sold to Hitachi 
So we, more or less a fourth of our company will be sold off. We will maintain a share in that. But that work keep going. And I think that's one thing uh, that is quite important to, to, uh, to, uh, to underline. If you have a strategy, you have to be able to, to pull it through no matter what the other consequences. Of course, you will adapt, but you have to stick to it no matter how we meet and not meet. And we're also in the, in the process of having a new CEO in place, Björn Rosengren, and we're also building a new type of, of business model. And uh, we have not, you know, slacked anything in this. In, on the contrary, I think we've been even more focused now because we know it's even more important. Uh, so uh, hopefully we will be able to, to launch this new organization and we're midst in it and, and we're doing that. And thirdly, we're also trying to find a, a little bit more a restart of our, the purpose of, of our organization, of ADB, and what that is all about, and I've been a part of that. So all this strategic work, you have to continue to do it, uh, and maybe we lose a little bit on the digital, but I think within the company, you're still able to do these things. Uh, it's, it's rather when you, when you go outside the company, I think we, we are feeling a little bit uh, not uncertain, but it's a little bit uh, blunt, this whole way we operate, even though you meet people. Uh, and then fourthly, of course, uh, what was interesting for us, I mean, ABB, everybody knows our company, we're very old, we're, we're not a startup, we're not, uh, we're not considered like Spotify or something, you know. Uh, but what happens now, with everything going on in the economy, I mean, we are standing up. We're resilient, we've seen crisis before, and uh, there's quite an interest in our companies to see how the big industrial companies are able to reinvent themselves and stand steady uh, when crisis hits. Uh, so I think we'll, in terms of being attractive employer and all those things, I think that's one reflection I have that, yeah, good for you being in a solid company. Yeah, we're in a solid company, but we also have to reinvent ourselves. And uh, before this uh, seminar, I talked to Freely about she, come, she should work for us because we're all in this digitalization business, automation business. Um, and, and when we look at uh, the future of, of the world, what would it be like after COVID? That's something that we have been really focusing on. And we have done it because we want to, but also there's been a demand. The government has asked us, what is it that you can do for society to kickstart the economy? Uh, chambers have asked us, do you want to be part of a, a commission that will restart the economy? And I think that's quite uh, interesting to see how uh, a majority of the associations we've been a part of has not said it's a crisis situation. Yes, they have said it's a crisis, but they also said this is an opportunity for us to really do something that we would not otherwise have done. Uh, so. Uh, we have come forward with a number of suggestions. Uh, you know that we are in spearheading, for example, robotization. Uh, could we use this opportunity to provide uh, robots to small and medium-sized enterprises? And the big ones, they have it already. But what can we do to make robots effective in a small, say, bakery or uh, somebody who's producing something in small land? What does it take to do that investment? Well, it's a little bit too, too expensive to invest in a whole robot, but if the government can provide us with a, an automation type of, of a subsidy, we might be interested. And if ABB can help us do a pilot to see how we make money out of this investment, that would be something. And can you imagine if we were able to, to automate, say, 25,000 medium and small sized companies? That would be a tremendous uh, effect on productivity and make us more competitive. Another area, of course, is, is, um, is uh, when it comes to electrification. It's happening right now. Of course, the car market is stalling a little bit, but isn't this the time when we actually make the whole electrification happen? Uh, charging station across the country, across Europe, shouldn't we invest in this right now? Uh, and somebody has to help out with that. And the government can do its part, regions, cities, uh, car companies, and we can pull together to roll out what has been pilots and make it uh, scalable. Uh, because that's usually the Swedish model, we are always spearheading, having a pilot, and then uh, after you know five, ten years, the Chinese make it cheap and, and make the money out of it. 
So we have to make sure that we can make this scalable and do it quicker and faster. Uh, and we need to do this with the government. Uh, then I always get this question now, are you, uh, are you forgetting about sustainability? We say on the contrary, this is the moment where we have to uh, step up our efforts in sustainability. Uh, because um, it was quite interesting, we had another seminar with India, uh, the Swedish India Business Leadership Forum, and they called in from Delhi and said, "Look, guys!" And they took they turned the computer to the to the to the to the sky and to the mountain. Said, I haven't seen the mountains since I grew up here. That person was 34 years old. So they were. You know, they said, "We don't want to go back to what it was before. We know how the city can look like. Could you? Couldn't you guys talk to Volvo and to the other car companies and to Tata?" Uh, make it happen now in Delhi. So I think it's, it's also an opportunity for us. And I think the same happened in China, but I'm afraid that as soon as we're back in normal, if we, we would go back to this small, and hopefully we have learned something during this period too. So sustainability will be a, a really a key message from us because we have the technology to do it. Uh, and simply there won't be enough clean energy out there. Uh, so we need to have efficiency invest in new engines, drives, and so forth. So, so we are trying also to see this as a combination, using the COVID crisis to do the necessary investment in our own company, but also help society and the government to say, listen, there are investments that the state can do to make us more productive. Uh, and let's work on this together. Uh, and since ABB is not an end consumer type of company, we always work with others. Uh, I'm sure that we are customers to and, and uh, among this crowd here today, uh, and we have to do it together. And I, I think it's a beautiful thing these days uh, that no company is an island. You have to work, work with Microsoft or Apple and others to, to sell your products. And that forces us together, and that makes it also possible to introduce uh, this necessary technology which I feel is, is so necessary for the, um, uh, for the future of this planet. So I, I would stop with that, a uh, little bit outlook, uh, maybe just to say uh, that, I mean, there are a few trends in the world that, that should worry all of us. I'm not speaking from ABB now, but rather as the diplomat in me. Uh, I think from the outset, we all turn it to ourselves, the countries, but I think also we have seen how we have to cooperate uh, in this pandemic, uh, on the pandemic itself, but also on trade. Uh, and the global situation is getting a bit uh, ugly out there, to be, to be, uh, to be blunt. Uh, we, we, we see all these global institutions being challenged, uh, even from old allies like the United States and elsewhere. And I think business can always say that we need open trade markets. We need to be able to, to, be able to get offset on these markets. We are not politicians, but I think we can express our concern when we see markets getting, uh, you know, squeezed and uh, everybody's trying to do it on their own. Uh, people are talking about bringing back uh, production to their home country. Of course, we'll do that to some extent, but the, the beauty of globalization is that it, it makes the economy more efficient and it also spread wealth. And if it doesn't spread wealth, let's talk about that. How can we can we help out with inequality? But I historically closing borders has never been a good recipe for for growth and for for combating poverty and all those things. So um, just a message for, from from the diplomat and me. Let's work together on those issues as well. So I think I stopped there uh, and um, maybe going off topic a little bit. But this is what I work with. So so. Um, uh, hopefully that could bring something to the discussion as well. Thank, Thank you, you Jakob. Um, so um, now we uh, will do the uh, Q&A session. Um, I have no uh, written questions in the chat. If you want to uh, present a question to, uh, to w one of the participants in the panel, please use the, the raise the hand so that we can uh, have um, keep it in an orderly fashion. But I will kick off with a with a question um, perhaps to um, to Thomas. Um, have you noticed any changes in, in adherence to 
to meeting schedules, keeping um, meeting schedules, stay, uh, being um, being on time, attending meetings on time, and so on. Uh, during this time, I mean, we've had um, very reg an increased number of, of recurring and regular meetings. So, have you seen changes in, in people's general behavior here? Um, thanks for the question, Gustav. Uh... I start with a joke. We are a Swiss um, organization, so we'd like to be punctual. Uh, we haven't seen any change because of the COVID situation, um, be it, or in, in any in any chance. Um, no, actually, no. We didn't we didn't see any any changes. I think we had in the beginning, as we as we heard also from from Sebastian, um, to to be more sensible and uh, respect maybe the the personal space uh, because uh, schools were closed so people could not attend uh, the management meetings which usually stayed at eight o'clock in the morning we had to push them to nine or nine thirty because of, of the private situation so that that was more of the challenge of reaccommodating the agendas of, of, of our of our people but um, in terms of attending meetings um, that worked very very well and uh, we didn't see any change there okay Thank you. Um, very early in, 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 the, um, um, in this webinar, I actually saw somebody raise a hand who has probably renamed him or herself. It was, uh, the person was called 093084. Uh, did you have a question that you wanted to, to present or was this just a slip, of the, a slip on the keyboard? Okay. Uh, we have a very shy person here. So, um, do we have, have any any uh, other questions from the audience? I have a question, uh, Sebastian. Yes, I have a question uh, on um, on 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 the chat about uh, the future in the construction business, and uh, are employees worried about their jobs? And um, about construction, it's it's very difficult to uh, to say. Uh, what we have seen in the past in terms of crisis at Sika, all the crises globally, is uh, the first shift we see in construction is uh, people move from do it for me to do it myself. Um, that means the retail and distribution usually is increasing and, uh, and the craftsman and the, the professional is decreasing. So this is usually a shift we see the last 20 years, like uh, a move uh, in that way. Another move we have seen is also uh, new construction is declining and repair and maintenance is increasing. Uh, so I would say all the projects budgeted, started, ongoing will continue. And I think a lot of investors will maybe postpone and invest more in uh, maintenance. But I can tell you right now we have uh, three major projects. Uh, we have uh, Nellies.com. It's a huge warehouse uh, where we are supplying the roof uh, in a suburb of Stockholm. It's a 60,000 square meter project. We have uh, Dagab Axe Food, the company owning um, uh, M Shop, Willis, and Matt.se, who is building a huge warehouse in Bolstar. Um, and we have Dollar Stores uh, building a huge warehouse. Uh, we are working also with Northvolt in Helefteo. Uh, so I would say there is a lot of business who are doing well. I'm sure we're going to see a decline in new hotel, restaurant maintenance, bar, uh, and maybe in hospitality business. So this is what I see in construction. About employees, are they worried about losing the job? That was the second question asked to me in the chat. Um, I would say it, at some point of time, employees were bombarded by uh, a lot of bad news in Sweden, uh, a lot of permitting, a lot of company closing, a lot of things and i think now we are going more to a, a more opti optimistic way uh, what i'm saying to our people is um, if we do things right uh, nothing will change uh, of course we we want to prevent it as much as we can thanks sebastian um i give the word to christian deloes you had a question 
Thank you, Gustav, and uh, thank you all for an excellent and uh, very interesting webinar. I have a question to uh, Sebastian and to Thomas, but uh, also to anyone else uh, of the speakers that would like to answer that. And now we know that uh, we're not going back to, to the old, good old days. So the new normal will be some kind of uh, framework work, which uh, actually puts completely new demands, as you've been talking about quite a bit already, uh, Sebastian and Thomas. And my question to you both and the rest of the panelists uh, is, or speakers is what are the uh, top leadership uh, skills required to succeed in the new future now that we have remote work and maybe a combination probably with some office work in the future, a hybrid? Do you want to start, Sebastian? I go ahead. Okay. Um, Thank you for the for the question, Christian. Um, I, I tried to to put them on my slide um, earlier or, or underline them. I think they're 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 from our experience three things, and I don't think they're new. They they should they're sort of differently accentuated, and that is first of all the trust um, in 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 working with people which are not physically in the same building or room that that they are. Uh, that they, they are participating, that the trust element, then the empathy element, which is is nothing new to all of us being managers, but I think the empathy of feeling the vis-a-vis via -vis camera and 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 the screen, and this is I, I really liked what Sebastian was saying of how he manages his team, his teams uh, virtually, and and listens to them and and makes sure that that there, there's still this fine line between, or the, this fine understanding between the lines of how people really feel and if they're bothered by something, that escalation of problems and de-escalation of problems has a different dynamic than sitting vis-a-vis -vis and having a coffee in the hand so, uh, and, and talking it out. So that, that, that's certainly this empathy, this trust, and, and the creation and continuously adaptation of the culture of the organization is necessary um, because traditional companies or, or us being a, a governmental entity in, in, in some way uh, has a different culture in working remotely or, or, or less maybe dynamic. And, and we've been forced into, into qu quickly changing that. And, and that required a cultural change. That's also something we heard from, from Jacob and, and Sebastian. And I, I fully under, uh, su support that, that, um, that position. So nothing new. But maybe more present and and uh, and to be to be reconsidered. And uh, I I would just quickly also would like to afterwards like to hear what what Frida has to say to that because there's probably tons of research on that, on that from her side. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Okay. Um, I think we we have a question from uh, Eva Hoisling. Yes, good morning. Thank you so much. It was very interesting. I, um, I agree very much with what Jakob said uh, regarding the network and increase your network and get into contact, come into contact with new people. And um, this is really, really difficult in these times. You can deepen your existing network. It's much easier to organize things even uh, with people around the globe because they don't have to come to your place. Um, but it's very, very difficult to, 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 yeah, to increase your network and get to know new people. And that must be extremely difficult for new employees starting a new job. How do you do that if you don't meet your colleagues? So I would like to hear some kind of ideas around that. How could you deal with that uh, challenge? Thank you. Okay, who would like to take this? Well, I can try because I, I have been quite new to ADV. I only worked there since September and I was, well, I was introduced quite quickly, but of course it's a big organization and uh, uh, our team, DRPA, we work in almost 12 markets, uh, physical space. So uh, I think uh, I only met a tenth of the, of the, the colleagues uh, physically actually. So. Uh, and I think we've been quite good, in fact, to to have some type of mentorship. You you have your it has to be uh, somebody who introduces you, and they talk, and then you all of a sudden you find each other. So it's it's a little bit bring bring a friend or bring a colleague to another colleague, I think. And that's uh, 
something that I think every organization that is big, we have 150,000 employees, uh, have to do. Uh, and I also think uh, what has been even more important now are all these beekeeper type of uh, networks that we have messages coming out every day, more or less from, from business alliance and from leaders are saying, I did this today, and I met with this today, I haven't forgotten you. So I think in every big organization, you have a lot of internal communication and uh, uh, sometimes even too much. Uh, but those channels have been more important now since you're not meeting with the... Um, with, with your executives. But I think, um, yeah, I, I, I do believe there is a generational gap here, in fact, that uh, the young seem to be taking on quite easily. Uh, they work uh, with WhatsApp and they, they mix work with, uh, with business and there's a little bit more flux, I think. Uh, so I think there's a, there is a, certainly a lot of research to be made here and how can we make it more efficient. But I, like everything else, if you want to meet a new person, either you meet them by introducing yourself, or you're being introduced, and uh, maybe that's something we're taken for granted. So, it, it, uh, it, but it doesn't happen now in this world, and maybe you're not thinking about it. And I think Sebastian, you have really, uh, really inspiring the way you have uh, you set up these weekly meetings. I think just just having a, a meeting without a purpose, then to listen. I mean, who does that these days? Uh, and, and I think that's, that's really something I will, I will uh, remember. I mean, uh, uh, Swedes, they always have to have a purpose. I, I think the Swiss has to have a purpose. Otherwise, we don't know why, why are we in this meeting. There's no purpose. But the purpose is actually not to have the purpose. It's just to find out what's going on and uh, what, what's, what's, what's cooking. And uh, just having an open-ended question, how are you doing, my friend? How's life? And you start there and then you sign up. I think that's... Um, I, I think that's the one thing I will take home from, from, from this video conference, in fact. So thank you very much for that. Do we have uh, any other questions? Gustav, maybe um, I, I, yep. I mentioned um, maybe Frida can can say also mm -hmm. something on the on the research of, of leadership and, and how, how she sees that. Thank you. Yes. And how to build and how to build a strong culture when we now have the virtual leadership that's very very essential yeah it is I totally agree so so thank you for for asking uh, so starting off with the leadership, yes, of course, there's a, a huge amount of literature on this on this subject, but I think what you already mentioned is really the key here it's it's nothing new, but we just have to and we have a lot of these skills and traits already as managers and leaders, but we just need to exaggerate them. We need to be, be stronger uh, on these areas. And it really goes back to the informal aspects that I mentioned in the beginning. These are the ones that are going to help us through the crisis. Of course, we have to be strategic and look at numbers and all that. We have to look at the formal aspects, of course. But the informal ones are the ones that are going to help us. And regarding culture, yes, that goes hand in hand with the vision, vision development. To create, and this is something we see in a lot of research about digital transformation and transformative leadership. You have to build a very compelling, attractive vision for the company that is easy to visualize. It should be easy to see yourself in the future. What, is it, what does it look like when we reach this end goal, so to say? How does it feel? Uh, what does it, does it smell like, even? So it should be really you know, tangible and very attractive. And that, so that's the first thing to have this vision in place because that will help you create the culture uh, in the company and, and to strengthen the culture in the organization. And also what we normally say is that, what we can see also is that you have to operationalize this ground vision into what does it mean for you? What does it mean for you, Christian? What does it mean for you, Sebastian? What does it mean for you, Andrea? And so on. What is, what is your part of this vision? Because then you will create this feeling of purpose, this feeling of belongingness. And this is especially important for the younger generations that are more value driven. Uh, I think everyone that is over 40 years old, we are the last ones of the generation that did something because they have a sense of a duty. Of course, I have to do this. This is my duty to do this. But younger generations don't have that. So it's more like value driven. What is the higher purpose that I'm serving here? What, what can I contribute with? So we need to be very explicit here. And we, if we do that, we can really build a culture, although we're working in different locations. It doesn't matter because we will buy into this greater idea. So 
it can be hard to learn, but I think my, my point of view is that everyone can be charismatic. Everyone can be visionary. It's just a, a matter of, of daring to and practice a little bit. So try to, to work with, with the vision uh, is really important. And just to highlight what you said before here already in the discussion, I mean, being empathetic is also super important. It doesn't mean that you have to be like a psychologist or a therapist, but it means that you understand where people are uh, in the organizations, where they are emotionally, what their concerns are. Um, and this is what we normally do as managers and leaders when we pick up all these, these signals and cues in the conversations and chats and so on in the organization. But to really understand where people are, what are their worries, what are their concerns, and also try to see how can I meet them, how can I help them. And this links also to what we're seeing in, the, in this crisis, that we have more a flatter organization, we have a more dispersed organization. We're reducing the boundaries, as we said before, it's easy to communicate directly with top managers. Well, this is a, as part of it, then it becomes even more important as a leader to be, have this more social side and not only controlling uh, agendas, results, setting plans, and so on. So the softer side become even more important. I have a follow-up question for, for you, uh, Frida. Um, you are underlying the importance of, of a vision, and also that we will uh, probably have, um, according to surveys, a um, shortage of 85 million talent by 2030, according to some, some um, reports. So the question is, um, wouldn't, wouldn't it be a good or beneficial or even needed that uh, to look at the purpose before doing the vision work, why do we exist? And, uh, to do that in a, in, in a human-centric, empathic way. Uh, what, what is your view on this? Mm. I think that's an that's a extremely good point, and I totally agree with you. And yes, and that really goes back to the old classic literature in marketing, right? The marketing myopia. What kind of business are we in? What is our purpose? Are we making railways or are we a transportation company? If you look at the companies like uh, Corona that are, that are making lifts and escalators, uh, well, they're not in, in the escalator business, they're in the people transportation business. So uh, that's, that's part of this, uh, this work that you have to do. And it goes back to what Jacob said before, this is a time also to reinvent yourselves as organizations. We have got like a, a pause now to reflect and think about, okay, so things are going to change. We're going to move into the next normal phase. No one knows what exactly what it's going to look like. What could be our role in this? So if you, if you go back also to, to theories about disruption, you can talk about creative destruction, right? To Schumpeter. So a disruption, yes, it destroys the existing structures, the existing ways of working, but it's also a room for being creative and coming up with new solutions, new ways of working, new services, new businesses, new business models, whatever. So I, my advice would be to focus on the creative side of this and have fun. What are you doing? Yes. That's always important. Yes. Sebastian, um, a question. How do you balance the short uh, with the long term? Because that is the issue that many leaders today, that, that they wait uh, and wait and wait. And that is, you know, a disaster. You will be out of business if you wait for too long. So you need to come away from anxiety and fear and also the short term um, a business to have a balanced view with the medium, the long term, to look behind it, even if you don't know what it is. So, how are you? How are you doing that, Sebastian? I think I'm doing. Um, I'm. I'm a little bit coming along with Jacob. Uh, uh, what we realized the first month was very hectic. We were reacting in the short terms, uh, taking care of the people, um, keep on servicing customers, and and of course staying in business. I would say. And quite rapidly, we realized uh, the long-term strategy and, and, the, and the purpose of the company and the values will remain in place. And as said Frida, uh, I think we are just shifting um, some way of doing it from, uh, of course, we, we still look at the numbers, but we know the numbers do not happen if you don't take care of the people. And uh, we have a 2023 strategy broken down in business plan and uh, I would say in a short term what am I doing today I'm just working on raising awareness I'm not doing anything else so I told my people I say look guys nothing's changed at the end 
okay? What is changing is just the road we are taking, uh, but nothing changed at the end. And so every Friday, uh, I try to be very positive uh, with all the organization. Um, and I also uh, raise awareness. So I'm not telling people to do things. I'm putting, I'm, 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 one guy is very inspiring for me is, um, I don't know if you had the opportunity to see some of the speeches of uh, Governor Cuomo, uh, how we dealt with the crisis at the beginning in New York State. And um, this guy was just like, okay, guys, I'm sharing with you the fact because I trust you will act according to what I'm sharing with you. And uh, I think it was very inspiring at the beginning. Uh, now it's becoming very political, but at the beginning, it was a, a great way on, uh, uh, we, we are strong, we know where we are, we are being hit, uh, but that will just slow us down. Okay. Um, I'm just uh, being a, a, a spoil sport now and looking at the time. Um, I think I promised the final um, uh, summary to Frida, and then I will actually, as moderator, have the final say. Like Great. Thank okay, thank you so much. So I've been making notes. Thank you all for your good questions and all the good, uh, good inspirational thoughts that you have shared here. Um, so just to summarize very quickly uh, some of the topics that you have covered, and I would like to start with perhaps one of the most important things that we talked about. It's a paradox that we are facing right now. On the one hand, we are becoming much more digital. We're working digitally and so on. But why we become more digital and more technical, the need for being more human is increasing, right? So as technology goes up, so does the need for being human. But this is basically what we talked about today all these informal conversations, supporting people, uh, opening up for, for discussions in, in the organization and so on. So that's really um, something I would like to share with you. And we also covered other topics that I think are important here that goes both to resilience, how can we be resilient uh, in crisis, but also how can we reinvent ourselves, as Jacob said before. Uh, this is really a chance to do so to take stock, what have we done so far, and what is going to happen in the future? And how can we position ourselves, uh, both regarding employees, but markets and uh, structures and everything, customers, ecosystems, politicians, to take that position in the future? So really dare to, to sort of think outside the box here. I think that's really important. And well, I have a lot of, lot of things here, but I shouldn't take too much time. So just let me share one thing that I think is really important here. Um, if possible, try to take the time to collect as many learnings as you can from your organization, because we have all learned a lot from this crisis that we didn't know like three or four months ago. So every employee has done an incredible learning journey. And if we can collect these learnings in our organizations, that would really help us to build more resilience, but also to refocus our work in for the future. So I think I'm going to stop there and give the word to Gustav. For the sake of keeping time. <laughs> Thank you, Frida. Um, did you did you had a second poll, if I remember correctly? Yes, I did. Um, it's more for fun. If we have time, we can have it. Yes. Otherwise, just yes. Do it. do it. Okay, Andrea, please. Yes. And here, I think you can you can uh, choose different alternatives. What will you do after the crisis? Will you go back to the old ways of working? What will you do? So do we have do we have any answers? Do you see Andrea? Yeah, it seems. Almost. Yeah, thirteen yes. votes. Oh, look at this! This is uh, this is very nice. So no one is going to go back to the old the old ways of working. And to be more flexible, yes, I, I totally saw the coming and there are lots of reports now showing the same that the majority of companies are going to encourage people or at least allow people to work remotely. It could be from home or it could be other places. Only 1% in the last report I saw was, was going to force their employees to come back. The rest are going to allow for more flexibility. Great, so I think we covered a lot of this. So thank you so much for sharing. 
Uh, Gustav, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, so I, I would first like to, um, well, I actually, I will do a final quick poll just to check um, if this, um, this uh, webinar was worthwhile or just a waste of, a waste of a proper working time. Andrea, could you present it? <laughs> Come on, please don't be shy. Somebody must be disappointed. <laughs> Excellent. Um, quite interesting to see. I'm pleased that, that it's been uh, um, uh, a, wor uh, a, a good way of, of, of sp spending your morning, your Thursday morning. I would like to thank um, uh, all participants uh, and I, of course, would like to uh, thank uh, Frida, Jakob, Sebastian, um, and uh, whom, oh, Thomas, of course, uh, for for uh, attending as as, as speakers uh, in this webinar. Uh, I would like to thank my co-pilot Andrea for actually doing the heavy lifting during the webinar, uh, taking care of the tech. And then I would like to thank the Stockholm School of Economics and House of Innovation for, for uh, letting us use the, the infrastructure uh, for this meeting. I think we've, it's been working quite well. And as I said, um, in the beginning, you will get the presentations that Thomas and, um, uh, and Frida uh, gave and you will also get the poll results and this uh, webinar was being recorded and will be published at least on the web page of the Swiss Chamber of Commerce. And on that note, I wish you a continued good morning and um, stay safe, wash your hands and uh, healthy, keep healthy. Bye. Thank you.